Welcome back to the Computer Hardware and OS Essentials lecture series. I created these custom lectures based on A plus certification program, but with few enhancements to improve your IT technical skills and knowledge. If you haven't seen my previous videos, I will post a link in the description for the playlist. This would be our 19th lecture and I will cover disk, partitions, file systems and volumes. The primary objectives of this lecture is to introduce you to the relationships between disk, partitions, file systems and volumes, explains the fundamentals of how different partition and file systems work, and we will cover how we can use Windows Disk Management Utility to manage the disk, partitions, file systems and volumes. Disk, partitions, file systems and volumes. Disk, sometimes referred to as drives, is typically used to describe a single physical storage device. However, the read-write devices are also often referred to as drives. For example, DVD drive, floppy drive, etc, etc. So when we say DVD drive, we don't mean the media, storage media itself. We mean the device that is used to read and write DVD drives, we, uh, DVDs we call DVD drives. So while the disks and drives are interchangeably used, drives are oftentimes sometimes refer to the device in which the storage media is um, being read. For example, floppy drive or DVD drive. Typically, disk and drives are interchangeably used to describe the media itself. So for example, you may say, hard drive disk or hard disk uh, or hard drive, either way it will, it, it will be uh, describing the storage device itself. SSD, which is stand for solid state drives and USB flash drives are referred to by drives as opposed to disk because they don't actually have disk at the first place. So for example, uh, the, the hard drives with platters, they actually do have the disk, spinning disk inside there, but the SSDs and USB, they are chips based. So that's why they are oftentimes referred to as uh, drives as opposed to disk. Partition is a designated uh, part of a disk or other storage device that defined by st a starting position and a length. So what make a partition a partition in, in, on a disk is that this is the actual storage device itself. The partition is a designated part of that single disk or the storage device, and it has a specific starting point and a length. So how the partitions have different sizes. There can be several partitions within a one storage device. So you can have one hard drive with multiple partitions, which we will look into uh, in further in the next few slides. Partitions cannot span non-adjacent regions or multiple devices. So if you are partitioning a hard disk, for example, or hard drive, for example, you can't partition it uh, you know, in a, a way that it is non-adjacent. So the one partition is going to be adjacent to the next partition, going to be adjacent to the next partition. And that's how the partitioning will be created. Partitions are optional and not required for data storage. So a lot of students think that partitioning is a requirement for data storage, but please keep in mind, this might show up on your A plus certification exam. Partitioning is not a requirement for data storage. For example, the USB sticks and memory cards often do not use partitions. Uh, it doesn't mean they don't, sometimes they do, but oftentimes you don't need the partitioning on USB sticks and memory card. Formats associated with partitions uh, do include, uh, you know, two main two different types called MBR and GPT. Uh, there are other partitioning types as well that being used in Linux and other uh, operating systems as well. So keep that in mind. Partitions are designated, well-defined starting positions and length of like different sections of your disk or drive itself. And partitions are not needed for data storage However, it is being used in many, many uh, places such as the Windows operating system and Linux. 
File system is a set of rules defining how files are sorted. So it defines how files and directories are sorted and organized on the media. So you could think of that as a you have a disk at the initially and you have a partitions that have been created if partitions are needed, for example, in Windows operating system. And the file system is on top of all of that, you will have the file system itself that would be setting the rules on how the files will be stored on that partition itself. So it defines how files and directories are stored and organized on the media. So done on the disk partition volume or even the file itself. So uh, you know even though uh, you know in Windows it is on top of the partition, uh, you can do it on the disk itself or partition is uh, on top of the partition or the volume uh, or even the file itself. So you can. Uh, you know, um, uh, assign that file system in any of those uh, stages. So uh, the file system is also responsible for enforcing numerical limits. That means the file system uh, algorithms will define how many files can be uh, on that particular file system at a one given time, uh, what is the maximum file size, uh, how long a file name can be, restrictions on file naming etc uh, etc et so for example there may be some reserved words that you're not allowed to use uh, to create files uh, you may not be uh, allowed to put uh, a certain um, long uh, number of uh, texts and characters or certain characters on your file names uh, or in, even inside text files those are all defined by the file systems rules while classical file system does not aware of uh, the storage media the modern file systems is aware of the storage media. What that means is, for example, compared to uh, NTFS, for example, uh, compared that to REFS, uh, in REFS in Windows, uh, what happens is the file system goes all the way down to the storage spaces pools layer for error recovery to, and to optimize this space usage. So. REFS is in a sense is no longer a classical file system because classical file systems in up here what happened is it's basically defining how files and directories can be saved and enforce the numerical limits but other than that the file system is unaware what kind of medium or hardware it, where the, the file system is associated with because it will be on top of uh, the partition volume of uh, the file itself for example but with the newer modern day uh, file systems such as REFS, it goes all the way down to the storage pool layer uh, for error recovery and optimization of this space. So that's what makes the file system a file system. So the key features of file system for your exams, what you need to remember is, is it defines how directories uh, and files are created and organized and it enforces numerical limits. So what is a storage spaces? Uh, when I discuss uh, storage spaces here, which you probably may have uh, heard before, or you may never heard bef uh, heard this before uh, this term before, uh, which uh, is what we're going to discuss on our next slide. So the Windows storage spaces, which I mentioned on my previous slide, is a technology in Windows operating system, whether it's a desktop operating system or server, that can help protect data from drive failures. So in other words, Windows Storage Spaces is a methodology or a system in which uh, utilizes uh, certain properties of file systems uh, to manage how uh, those uh, volumes and drives and uh, you know systems are created. So similar, it is very similar to that of a RAID a software RAID, uh, in which you can group three or more drives together into a storage pool. So the Windows Storage Spaces allow the creation of uh, storage pools using multiple drives. Um, so you could view that as a, a type of uh, software RAID. So you can view Windows uh, storage spaces uh, is kind of a synonym for a type of a software RAID. So that's how that's all you need to know for this particular um, class. Volumes and pools. So this is another two terms that you may have come across. Uh, windows without storage spaces so where we just have a hard a single hard drive which is the case for most of your end users uh, what's going to have you're going to have a single hard drive so there are not going to be any windows storage spaces creations there 
So what happens is you have a C drive or an E drive or whatever you, the drives you have. Uh, what's going to happen there is a volume is a collection of one or several partitions. So I will explain this in the next on the next slide what I, that actually means. So you have a hard drive. It doesn't have the Windows storage space as created. So let's say it's a C drive, which is the case for 90% of your customers uh, or your end client or your corporate client. And that that hard drive, that, hard, that, that storage space is considered as a volume in Windows. That volume can contain one or several partitions uh, to support the operating systems and other applications that are being installed. However, the Windows with storage spaces where we are going to create the pools uh, of uh, the, the these type of pools, which is a type of a software rate pools, we will have pools and volumes that are controlled by the storage spaces. So in that situation, in the Windows storage spaces, uh, it has a file system that is independent of how the pools and volumes are created. So the file system itself going to be NTFS, for example, but that's going to be independent of how storage spaces, pools and volumes are created because the file system is going to be riding on top of that. And in this situation, the pool is a collection of physical disk and that's it. So just like it says, like a, the term pool in English, we refer to as like a pool of investors or pool of, uh, you know, market share, a pool of, uh, you know, items or pool of uh, something, right? So it's a collection. The term pool in English is used as a, another term for collection. So in here, in Windows uh, with storage spaces, the pool is referring to a collection of physical disks. So the pool is referring to the disk itself. So the multiple disks uh, within it's uh, associated with each other. Pool does not define redundancy, but defines disk roles, which are used to store data, which SDDs, uh, also known as solid state drives, are used for caching and which disks are held for uh, reserve uh, or spares. So all of those information will be defined through the pool itself. So remember, we view the uh, Windows storage spaces like a RAID, software RAID type, but it's not really a software RAID type. So what the pool is doing is basically, uh, you know, defining, uh, you know, what will be the actual space allocating for uh, putting user data or the software data, et cetera, et cetera, and what space will be reserved or spares. Volume is a disk space allocated from the pool. So once you have a pool, on top of the pool, we will create the volumes. So the volume is a disk space allocated from the pool and it defines the redundancy, then in other words, the RAID level and caching policies. So multiple volumes with different redundancy levels and caching settings can coexist in the same pool. And then the file systems are created on top of those volumes. So in Windows uh, storage spaces, we have the pool, and on top of that, uh, we have the volume, and on top of that, we will end up with the file systems. So that's how you can view the Windows uh, Windows with storage spaces. Again, I will give you some nice diagrams uh, so that it is easy for you to visualize what I'm talking about here, but just remember these basic fundamental concepts. So here's a diagram or a screenshot of a Windows 11 disk management uh, you know, window, uh, which I have taken a screenshot of. And here you can see at the top, uh, I have labeled the file system. So the file system is clearly labeled at the top right here, saying file system. And each uh, volume is listed on the left-hand side. And under the file system, it'll tell you what file systems it is using. Like for example, in here, we have the C drive with the file system NTFS. And when on this side, when you read the disk two, disk three, disk four, disk five, what you're reading here is the actual physical disk. So you can consider disk one, disk two, disk three, disk four, disk five, et cetera, as the physical disk itself in here in the disk management. And what, a, what is defined as a volume here is that on disk five, for example, this entire green box represent a volume. So it has multiple partitions within that volume because partitions 
in uh, within a desk in together can uh, represent a volume so for example the healthy recovery is a partition then the the ntfs uh, is a partition and then we have the ntsf another boot so we this is a dual boot system that i created for my lab environment uh, so we have a, another partition here for c drive and that that's a another uh, partition and we have another partition here called healthy another one right here so we have two uh, efi systems sorry one efi system and we have a ntfs two ntfs system and we have a recovery so all of these uh, in together one two three four partitions uh, are sitting inside this one physical disk called disk 5 and that disk 5 with all of these partition together creates a volume so this is a single volume even though uh, in windows <laughs> it's actually defined as a volume 1 volume 2 right here so for example c volume e volume for example you know technically they are not really volumes per se but you know that, that's where things get a little bit muddy because of windows how they define it but typically partitions together can create a volume so for example you can say e volume is this entire thing and the c volume could be this entire thing but at the end of the day uh, the fundamentals of computer science basically denotes because this is on a single disk all of these partitions create a single volume ZFS is a file system used by Linux and Mac OS. So ZFS also has pools, but the other one it has that is not found in uh, Windows typically is called datasets. So the pool is again, is the same like a Windows. It is a collection of disks. It is grouped into one or more disk groups uh, called uh, VDEVs in ZFS. And each VDEV define RAID level used for its disk group. The redundancy, also known as the RAID level, is therefore defined at the pool level in this situation. And the data set in ZFS is a file system. So just like NTFS, the data set is a type of a file system that's a set of files and directories, how, you know, that the file system is defined and using this, the, you know, the disk space from the pool. ZFS can also export a block device called Z wall or also known as Z volume. Uh, and those are used for iSCSI. And I'm not going to go into detail on how iSCSI work in this lecture because it's not part of your A plus certification program, but I will discuss that on a separate lecture when we do all the other lectures on my YouTube channel. So that's why you need to make sure that you subscribe to my YouTube channel if you're interested in uh, more advanced computer concepts uh, that may not be covered in our A plus certification program lectures. So just remember that, you know, ZFS can also export a block device called v volume, uh, is Z vol or Z volume uh, that is used in iSCSI. What is iSCSI? You don't need to worry about that for this lecture. Uh, so uh, basically what that is, is internally it is implemented as Z vol volume or Z, uh, Z vol uh, as a data set with a single file. So that's what make it a data set. Compared to the Windows storage spaces, ZFS controls the entire storage stack from top to bottom because ZFS will be running from pool all the way to, up to the data set uh, as opposed to where the file systems in uh, Windows methodology, uh, you have the file system writing at the top of the volume or partition. So that way you are not actually controlling the file systems from the pool level. So keep that in mind so i'm going to be sh show you a visualized diagram of what i actually mean on my next slide so here is a visualized diagram of uh, certain things that i have discussed uh, that may be a little bit confusing without uh, this type of a visualization so i created this diagram so that you will have a much better understanding uh, of comprehensive understanding of how this works so in here uh, we have a couple of di diagrams uh, showing uh, you know, discussing how file systems, partitions uh, works and the pools works, right? So on the most left-hand side, this diagram right here, we have a file system right on top of the physical drive. This is what most USB uh, drives, like the USB sticks and SD cards uh, use. So if you have an SD card on uh, some cell phones or you know, even cameras, for example, they most likely have a physical drive, which is the SD card, and you have a file system right on top of it. So this is the most simplest form of 
uh, you know disk partitions file systems and volume creations and in here we have the next one is the simple setup which is used by uh, both windows and linux and this situation we have a physical drive so for example a hard drive then you have a partition created on top of that hard drive whether it's a windows partition or a linux partition it doesn't really matter you have a partition created and right on top of the partition we have the file systems associated with that so this is a very simple way of creating partitions file system uh, on top of the uh, hard drive or the you know storage device and the next one is this windows software raid option so remember this is like similar to uh, windows storage spaces which i discussed which is looks like this uh, but instead of windows storage spaces we, you can also actually create raid volumes uh, in the uh, disk management utility in windows uh, which i haven't discussed in detail in this lecture uh, but i already have a i already have posted a video on my uh, YouTube channel, uh, you can go ahead and watch that. I will leave a link in the description as well as a card on the top right hand corner uh, so that you can click on that. That will explain how you can create a Windows software RAID within your uh, Microsoft Windows operating system. So if you do that, what's gonna end up with is you will uh, start with multiple physical hard drives. So let's say there's two physical hard drives and you're gonna create two partitions on top of that. But then, on top of that partition, you will have a volume. The volume is the one that's gonna unite these two partitions and these two hard drives together, and then the file system gonna write on top of that. So this is what the Windows software RAID is going to do with multiple hard drives. And the next one is the Windows storage spaces option. So this is not the Windows software RAID that you find on in the, you know, discussed right here, but this is the storage space option. In here, what happened is you have multiple physical drives. So let's say you have two physical uh, drives in here. And then on top of that, we are creating a pool right on top of those two physical hard drives or multiple uh, physical drives. Then the volumes are created or from that pool separating different, uh, you know, uh, different uh, storage spaces on top of those that uh, one single pool and then the file systems uh, associated with each volume will then be uh, put on top of that. So in this situation, first you unite the physical storage spaces into a one single pool, then you divide them into different volumes and then in within those each volume that we will be installing the file system. And then on the bottom of the screen, what we see is the ZFS type of file system, which is used by Linux, Unix, as well as the Mac operating system. So what the Mac operating system and Linux operating systems, what they do, they if there are multiple hard drives, so they take the two multiple hard drives, then you have the partition created right on top of it. So you have a partition right there, and then the pool comes into play, and then we have data sets dividing that pool into multiple pieces. But at the same time, the file system now goes all the way down to the pool and operates from the pool level up to the data set level. So the file system is not sitting on top of the data set, not sitting on top of the pool. File system is not sitting on top of the partition like we happen here, but instead the file system is coming up, uh, starting from the uh, pool and going across uh, the data set uh, uh, area. So basically in this situation you have multiple physical drives, then you have the partition on top of that individually, then you create a single pool, and then the data sets separate that pool into different uh, sectors. And then the file system will start from the pool and go all the way to the data set itself. I just want to point out one thing with these diagrams. For your A plus certification exams, you don't need this much more detail on how this thing works. However, I'm adding this to enhance your understanding of how disk partitions, file systems and volumes work. Because I believe if you do not understand these fundamental concepts associated with these type of different uh, arrangements of file systems, partitions, uh, pools, etc., you will have a hard time in the industry 
uh, you know um, going forward so that's why I added this slide so again this probably not gonna show up on your A plus certification exam but I highly recommend that you understand this slide because that will give you a comprehensive understanding of what we have covered today how partitions and file systems work low-level formatting is a process usually perform at the factory that organizes the space in a long series of logical blocks. This is called logical block addressing, also known as LBA. The drive is further organized into one or more partitions using one of the two partitioning systems. So if you are using a Windows operating systems, this is what's gonna happen. So you buy the, the device and the storage device will have low level formatting and then once you plug that hard drive or solid state drive onto your uh, computer you can further organize uh, that particular storage device uh, into one or more partitions using two partitioning systems those two are called mbr partitions and gpt partitions mbr partitions keeps a map of partitions in a partitioning table stored at the beginning of the hard drive called MBR and can have up to three primary partitions uh, also called the volumes and the fourth partition called the extended partition can hold one or more volumes called logical drives. GPT partitions on the other hand uh, stand for the globally unique identifier partition table also known as GUID or GPT system and that can support up to 128 partitions and is required for drives larger than 2.2 terabyte and this is one of the key reason why as of 2022 we recommend that you install your windows using GPT partitions and whenever you add a additional hard drive uh, to create GPT partitions over MBR partitions because it support over 2.2 terabyte hard drives and can support up to 128 partitions. In GPT partitions, the first sector in GPT system contains the protective MBR, which provides information to legacy software that does not support GPT. So that's another advantage of using GPT. Just because of you have GPT um, partitioning on your hard disk doesn't mean the specific any specific core software that require MBR cannot run on it it can but if you have an MBR partition you can't you know have any hard drive larger than 2.2 terabyte all partitions in GPT are tracked in a single partitioning table stored in the GPT header so that's how the GPT works Again, here's a visualized uh, diagram explaining MBR versus GTP structure. I have another diagram on my next slide as well. You don't need to know this much in detail for your A plus certification exam, but this is a fundamental concept. Again, you need to understand to be a better IT technician. So for MBR, as you can see, you have the master boot record uh, with these uh, partitioning tables at the front and then you have whatever the partition you have for example C, E, F, etc. And then you have the extended partition associated with the logical drives G, H uh, and then etc, etc, etc. You can keep going. That's why I said logical drive N. And then uh, with the GTP one, you have the protective, uh, you know, uh, MBR at the front and then you have all the information associated with that then you will have primary uh, GUID uh, partitioning arrays and then backup GUID partitioning array associated with those and then uh, the primary partitions associated uh, in, within that uh, volume within that hard drive uh, will be uh, you know in between and again I will show you another diagram to understand the difference uh, as well but this this is the major difference that you need to understand so the MBR have the master boot record at the very front and then the partitions afterward and GPT we have this primary GUID partition entry array and then we have a backup GUID partition entry array and in between you can have multiple partitions. Here's another diagram that explains how GPT hard drives with multiple partitions work. I created this by with just you know the uh, for you to understand. So you have the protective MBR at the top and you have the GPT header partitioning table at the top and then you can have multiple partitions. 
uh, this is just for fun i put like c d e f then n u j l um, just some letters from my name sanuja uh, the reason for that is just to show you that you can have any uh, partition letter in fact you can have a b uh, as well if you wanted to because windows does allow that yeah, even though those are you know typically reserved for backward compatibility so you can name whatever the way you like and you can use the file system ntfs on each of those partition and then we will have the backup gpt header which is a copy of the partitioning table at the other side of this uh, you know equation so keep that in mind so this is this is this is just some additional information that is not necessarily going to show up on your a plus certification exam but something that you should understand when you're looking at uh, file partitioning systems windows file systems uh, before a partition or a drive can uh, use uh, can be used it must be uh, assigned to a drive letter so it, you know it's a c or a d or etc etc so before before you are trying to create a partition uh, you know the drive has to be assigned to a drive letter so you need you formatted using the file system so the file system is the overall structure and operating system used to name store and organize files on a drive as i mentioned on my previous slides right i'm just reiterating what i have already discussed the file systems supported by windows include ntfs refs and nfs ntfs is probably the most commonly used uh, file system as of 2022 in windows machines and it uses smaller allocation unit or cluster sizes um, you know smaller than uh, 32 um, uh, fat32 uh, as a result uh, it is more efficient and can can handle large files so ntfs use a smaller allocation unit or cluster sizes than the fat32 lot of student think this opposite way which is wrong <laughs> Okay, NTFS don't use larger unit or cluster sizes than FAT32. NTFS uses smaller allocation unit or cluster sizes, cluster sizes than the FAT32, which make it more efficient and which also mean that it can handle large files than larger files than the FAT32, uh, uh, you know, format. So keep that in mind. This will show up on your A plus certification exam most likely. REFS stand for Resilient File System. And it is designed to improve on the NTFS file system by offering better fault tolerance and allowing for better compatibility with virtualization and data redundancy. So you could think of as the next iteration or next generation of NTFS. NFS, which is stand for Network File System, is a client server file system that supports file sharing over a network uh, across a platform. So Windows servers, for example, use NFS uh, for file sharing across the network uh, between the server itself and the client that trying to uh, access that data. File systems supported by Windows also include uh, EXFAT, uh, which is used for large external storage devices uh, and you know to be used with uh, other uh, operating systems. For example, if you want to save a file onto a external device, uh, then you want to read that external device from a Mac OS, you have to format that drive into EXFAT first, and then you can save it from the Windows uh, computer and then read it on the Mac OS. So it is it allows cross-platform uh, sharing of files. Uh, on drives so for example you have external hard drive your friend has a windows uh, sorry my mac computer you have a windows computer as long as that external fat, uh, hard drive is in ex fat you can save uh, let's say an image file uh, jpeg file uh, on that ex uh, ex fat sorry ex fat uh, fat uh, hard drive and give it to your friend who use a mac and uh, your friend with the mac would be able to read that file FAT32 used for small hard drives or USB flash drives. Uh, unless there is a need to use flat, FAT, sorry, FAT32, I would not use FAT32 uh, in modern day. The reason for being the limitation on how big of a file that it can handle. I believe it is four gigabyte or something, a single file um, FAT32 can handle. NTFS doesn't have that limitation, so that's why. Uh, CDFS, which is stand for Compact Disk File System, and UDF, uh, um, another type of file, two file system. So the CDFS is an older file system used by optical disk and is being replaced by the UDF, which stand for Universal Disk Format. And those are 
uh, in use. UDF is still in use, I believe, in Blu-ray and other devices. So it's still in use, but it's not uh, necessarily uh, very prevalent or common in computer industry. How partitions are used during the boot? Uh, with MBR hard drives, one of the primary partitions is uh, designated the active partition, which is the bootable partition that startup BIOS or UEFI look to when searching for an operating system. So with the MBR method of the partitioning, what happened is one of the partition is specifically sitting like as an active partition and that is what is going to denote or dictate the BIOS uh, to, to the BIOS or UEFI, hey, here is the operating system. So the active partition in MBR will get, get that communication with the BIOS or UEFI and help launch the operating system. In GPT system, the bootable partition is called EFI system partition, also known as ESP. You have seen that on my previous slide when I had a screenshot of the uh, disk management utility on my Windows 11 machine. You saw that, that the EFI per, uh, system partition. So in GPT system, basically the the active partition, instead of having an active partition we have in MBR is now replaced by something called EFI system partition or ESP. And UEFI turns to it to find and start the operating system. So in other words, uh, in GPT system, uh, the UEFI, uh, instead of the BIOS in this situation, uh, going to communicate with the ESP to figure out uh, where to launch or what to launch for operating system. Here's another thing you should remember, the MBR can work with both BIOS and UEFI. GPT is specifically designed to work with, uh, uh, with um, uh, the UEFI, so keep that in mind. In Windows, the MBR Active Partition or GPT ESP is called the System Partition. So if you are working with a Windows machine, whether it's a Windows Server or Windows Desktop, the MBR Active Partition or the GTP ESP or this one or this one is typically generally referred to as System Partitions. For Windows 10, uh, 11, Windows 8, 7, the boot manager program is named uh, boot MGR with no extension. The boot manager turns to the volume uh, that is uh, designed, uh, sorry, designated uh, the boot partition uh, where the Windows operating system is stored. So in Windows 11, 10, 8, 7, I forgot to add 11 here. Uh, the boot manager program is named boot MGR and what you need to remember is that the boot manager turns to the volume that is designated the boot partition and that's how the uh, you know windows operating system is launched when you uh, boot up your computer using disk management to manage hard drives disk management is the primary tool for managing hard drives disk management manages partitions prepare a new uh, drive for the first time use Mount a drive, use Windows dynamic disk and troubleshoot problems with the hard drive. You can use this management to resize, create, delete partitions, even create RAID volumes. As I mentioned before, the uh, Windows uh, software RAID, all of these things can be done through disk management utility. To shrink a volume using the disk management utility, right click the part uh, partition, right click inside the partition space and select shrink volume from the shortcut menu. Enter the amount in megabytes to shrink the partition. Be sure to leave at least 20% of free space for existing partition and click shrink. Because if you don't do that, it, you might run into slow computers or crashing of your computer. To create a new partition in unallocated space, again, you can select that unallocated space and right click inside that space and select new simple volume and follow the on-screen directions to enter the size of the volume in megabyte and select the drive letter for the volume and select a file system uh, or leaves the allocation unit size uh, at default. So you can decide the allocation unit size if you want to change it, you know. Uh, so you can go through that process. And here are some screenshots uh, of showing how you can go uh, about doing a shrink volume. In here, uh, I access my Windows 11 machine 
and I right click on my uh, the disk file uh, on the C disk and I can select the shrink volume and I can further shrink this volume because I have enough free space to do that. And when you click uh, right click on that partition, so in this disk, I select the C partition, right click on the C partition and click shrink volume and it'll give me this pop-up window and then I basically follow the instructions here to shrink. So it'll give you how much to shrink and I can change that value and I can click shrink to you know get the process going. I will do some live demonstration on this and post to my YouTube channel sometimes later. I have already posted on a video on RAID. Uh, I will leave a, a description in the, you know, I will leave a link in the description for that video if you're interested in watching that. So keep that in mind. Uh, these are some options that um, available on the disk management or utility. And in here, I'm showing how you can create a new sample volume. So I have a, two brand new hard drives. Each of them are about 10 gigabyte worth. And this particular hard drive, I pick, uh, selected this particular one, which is the disk four. And this allocator space, I right click on that inside that allocator space and select new simple volume. And that will give me this pop-up. And then when I click next, it'll give me another pop-up, uh, sorry, next window. And then I can dictate or decide how much of that volume, whether I'm gonna use the entire volume, which is the maximum space right here, or whether part of that volume will be created uh, with this new simple volume. In this new simple one, what it's gonna do is this unallocated space then will be partitioned into the volumes that I'm creating right here. Again, if you wanna see a demonstration of this, I can quickly run through a demonstration on my YouTube channels later sometime. Just know these things do exist. Prepare a hard drive uh, for the first time use or drive for the first time use. To prepare a drive for the first use, the first thing you need to do is to initialize the disk. When initialize, Windows identifies the disk as a basic disk, uh, which is the single hard drive that works independently of other drives. Next step, what you need to do is to create a volume and format it with a file system. To do that, right click in the allocated space, select new simple volume from the shortcut menu and follow the directions on the screen. It's the same thing as this one I mentioned on the previous slide right here. So here is a example of somebody initializing the volume. So this volume is unallocated, see right here, and it is not initialized. See right here, it says not initialized, but on this screenshot, which these are initialized. That's why it says online. Online basically means they are initialized, but uninitialized ones will show up as un not initialized with a red uh, cross right here. And then, you know, you can right click and go through the initialization process. Again, if you are interested in learning you know about this in a little bit more detail i'll do some demonstrations later sometime how to mount a drive so a mounted drive is a volume accessible by a folder on another volume so the folder has more uh, available space useful when folder is on a volume that is too small to hold all the data so you can create a mount point uh, and those mount point, for example, like C slash project folders, for example. And uh, the steps you need to take to mount a uh, drive is basically a volume that will host the mount drive must use NTFS file system, uh, use disk management, right click on the allocator space, select simple volume and use the wizard uh, to specify the amount of unallocated space that you want to divert to the volume. So follow the steps in the wizard and select the mount in the following empty uh, NFS, sorry, NTFS uh, folder and browse for existing folder for click the, or uh, click a new folder to create a new folder within that drive. So what a mounting is going to do is mounting going to give that a drive letter uh, as a volume. So that's what happened. Once you mount one of the, this thing, it will get a uh, drive letter, volume letter, for example. So that's what it does. So here is an example diagram of how a mounting would happen on a C drive. The C, the project folder can be mounted. So basically, you have the C drive with a 90 gigabyte, and the project folder get mounted on top of that. So that with the, it's it is sitting within the C drive, but it is gonna get mounted separately like that, right? So that's what it means. So here is a screenshot of how you can select a folder that will be mounted uh, to a point uh, for the new volume. So in here you can say, hey, 
uh, when you are creating a new um, a simple volume uh, in the wizard you have the option to pick mount the uh, following uh, empty ntfs folder and then you can mount it uh, by picking uh, through here so you can browse through here and select the mounting point here is an, a screenshot of a mounted drive in explorer uh, that appears as a very large uh, folder uh, so for example this folder it says project that is a mounted uh, file mounted mounted folder because you see that tiny arrow there uh, and then if you look at the information it is you know you, it is huge it has like 19.5 gigabyte in that folder but in, in fact it's not a folder it's a uh, mounted uh, drive so that's why it's, it has 19.5 gigabyte it doesn't have 19.5 gigabyte of data it only has about 63. 8 megabyte of data here so you know that's how what the mounting uh, look like windows dynamic disk several dynamic disk uh, can work together to collectively present a single dynamic volume so you can have multiple dynamic disk and the windows will present that to you as a single dynamic volume data to con uh, configure each uh, hard drive is stored in a disk management database this that resides in last one megabyte of space on each hard drive so if you have six hard drives for example or three hard drives for example or two hard drives for example you know the dynamic is if it is in a dynamic volume what happens is a data to configure each of those things will be taking up about one megabyte of space on each of those hard drives Three uses for dynamic disk includes for better reliability. So uh, configure a hard drive as a dynamic disk and allocate the space as a simple volume. Implement dynamic disk on multiple hard drives to extend a volume across these drives called the spanning uh, disk that will allow you to expand your entire hard drive space and can be used to piece uh, data across multiple uh, hard drives to improve performance and provide fault tolerance. Because we are using multiple hard drives now, the read write access may uh, get increased. So it might improve some uh, you know, performance in certain situations. So that's why we use the dynamic disk. So Windows dynamic disk uh, does support the RAID, which is the redundant array of inexpensive disk or redundant array of independent disk either or it's a synonym for each other is a that is basically a technology to configure two or more hard drives to work together as a array of drives please keep in mind raid is not backup backup is not raid i have already covered why that is and i have already done a lecture on raid uh, on my youtube channel so if you have not watched that please go back and watch that on my YouTube channel then you'll have an understanding of how RAID is not backup why how RAID is different from backup and etc so basically what RAID is do, gonna do uh, is uh, they join hard drives to improve performance uh, and it is called striping uh, or RAID 0 uh, works uh, you know the RAID 0 situation how it works is a shared between two hard drives but does not provide fault tolerance so that means it gives you uh, joining of two hard drives and you create a large uh, space for your data storage but if a one drive fails everything fails right copying one hard drive to another uh, as a backup is called mirroring also known as raid one which improves fault tolerance because if one drive fails you have another copy i know this is a misnomer you shouldn't be calling it back backup even though a plus certification textbook will use the term backup in raid one raid is not backup backup is not raid it is very important you understand that however you know uh, you could view raid one as type of a backup in a way because it is mirroring data between two hard drives so but that basically means is if one hard drive fails you would be able to rebuild your raid array the raid one array to recover your data a raid implemented using disk management is called software raid remember i used that term multiple times the software raid so the uh, RAID that you can create using the Windows disk management is a type of software RAID. The use BIOS UEFI setup on the motherboard that support RAID, which is called the hardware RAID. So the hardware RAID um, will have a, either a RAID card that goes into your PCIe or PCI slot, or a RAID system built into your motherboard that will handle the RAID at the hardware level as opposed to the software level. 
again i have extensively discussed about this on my previous lectures as well as i have done a video on how to create a software raid using windows disk management utility already on my youtube channel and i will post links in the description as well as the links on the top right hand corner on this video so you can click on them and watch them if you're interested in that a simple volume is stored on a single disk but a stripe volume or mirrored volume is stored on an array of dynamic disk so that's how you this is how you can visualize that what we just discussed so you have a single simple volume like this or you could have a stripe volume with multiple disks or mirror volumes with multiple disks the stripe volume uh, can have one single uh, drive letter with the striping across it and the mirrored volume will have one single uh, drive letter instead of uh, you know uh, striping it will have mirroring therefore we will create data redundancy here so the stripe that those are like a visualized way of looking at this you can use this management to convert two or more basic disks into dynamic disk so the disk management utility in windows can be used to convert two or more basic disks into a dynamic disk if you choose to do so use an unallocated space on these disks to create a simple volume or a windows array of disk using span or stripe or mirror volume and to convert a basic disk to dynamic right click the disk area and select convert to dynamic disk from the shortcut menu so the right click uh, free space on the disk and select new simple volume new span volume new stripe volume or new mirrored volume again i'm not, not i'm not going to sh demonstrate that right now in this lecture to keep this lecture as short as possible because it's already too long i will do it a, on a separate video so here is a screenshot however of uh, how you can convert a basic disk into a dynamic disk you so you be click uh, right click on there and select the convert uh, to dynamic disk now we're going to talk about windows uh, storage spaces so windows storage spaces in windows 11 10 and 8 is a potential replacement for raid uh, software i have discussed windows storage spaces at the beginning of this lecture when i introduced the the term windows storage spaces uh, and i said it is like a raid right so here's a little bit of more detail that you should know for your exams and quizzes so with uh, storage spaces you can basically create a storage pool using any number of internal and external backup drives so it is kind of a replacement for software raid you can view storage spaces as software raid uh, and uh, it creates one or more virtual drives call uh, spaces from this pool uh, and appear as a normal drive in file explorer storage spaces is this uh, designed for resiliency uh, which resists data loss in an event of uh, hard drive failure and the storage options include the simple two-way mirroring three-way mirroring and parity so again i have already covered a little bit about storage spaces here but um, you don't need to know any more depth into how storage spaces work for your a plus certification program but you need to understand that this option is a new option for software raid uh, the theme provisioning uh, is a type of provisioning that uh, allow uh, the additional physical devices uh, to be expanded as needed without reconfiguring the space available for the users so what that basically means is it's a type of provisioning you can do on uh, software raids and uh, your virtual machines for example uh, what happen is that when you have those storage uh, if you allocate uh, three terabyte of uh, virtual space it's not going to use that entire three terabyte at that moment because there's a thin provision so that's what the thin provisioning do um, I, it, i'm just introducing you to the term thin provisioning here so i'm not going to go into any more detail again here but just remember it does exist to set up a system to use storage spaces uh, this is what you need to do on a windows machine so on a windows 11 for example or windows 10 machines uh, it comes with support for storage spaces and this is what you need to do on windows attach any drives to the computer you intend to use for your storage pool in classic view of control panel click storage spaces click uh, create a storage pool uh, and storage space 
and respond to the UAC box, the user account control box, because you need to have administrative privileges to do this. Any drives that are compatible with storage spaces will be listed there and select the drives to format, then click create pool to prepare the drives. After the drives are ready, use the create a storage space window to assign a name and drive letter for the storage space and select a file system. Select uh, resiliency type, adjust the maximum size of the storage pool. And if you plan to use uh, thin provisioning, select that option as well and then create a uh, storage space. So in, this is where you can select the thin provisioning option. So when you're creating, uh, uh, you know, um, storage spaces, if you select that thin provisioning option, that entire three terabyte, remember, not gonna be used uh, when you create it right here, if you select that thin provisioning option. After the storage space is created, you can uh, uh, return to the storage spaces window to change the name, drive letter, and size of the existing storage spaces if you choose to do so. So here is a screenshot of how you can create storage spaces on a Windows 10 machine. I will do a comprehensive uh, demonstration video on my YouTube channel later sometimes. Again, I'm trying to keep this video as short as possible. So I'm just gonna show you a screenshot like this and move forward, okay? Just, just know that this, these options exist in your Windows operating system. You can use this management utility to also troubleshoot hard drive problems. And that includes the uh, drive and volume uh, statuses or statuses. Uh, you can check whether they are healthy, fail, online, active, EFI file system partition, where it is located, if whether it's got deleted or something happened or corrupted, for example, not really deleted because EFI, if the EFI system is deleted, you won't be able to boot. Uh, unallocated space, you can look at the formatting, uh, basic uh, dynamic formatting, what's in there. You know, you all of that thing can be viewed through the disk management utility, which you have seen few screenshots uh, in the past. Finally, we're gonna talk a little bit about improving hard drive performance. Windows needs at least 15% free space on hard drive. Even in Windows 11, you need around 15% of free hard drive space. Uh, it, it basically uses it as the working space and uninstalled software you no longer need can delete unneeded files occasionally uh, you know, through that 15% uh, space that you're uh, allocating. Disk management includes a disk cleanup, which is called uh, clear, clean mgr.exe, that's the utility. So this uh, disk cleanup utility deletes temporarily files on the hard drive. So you probably have seen that disk cleanup utility uh, on Windows. Again, I might uh, do a demonstration later. A hard drive can be optimized uh, to uh, improve performance. For magnetic hard drives, Windows automatically defragments the hard drive once a week. Unless you change this setting, it will be automatically set to defragments once a week. To, do, to defragment uh, uh, is to rearrange basically fragments of or parts of files on the drive. So each file is stored on the drive in uh, in a proper cluster. So that's what the defragment is doing. Basically, it has fragmented the hard drive. So they basically move those small fragments uh, and remove them, uh, all the empty fragments, all the deleted space and put all the other working fragments together. So it's easier and faster to access data and much more efficient. So defragmentation, making your hard drive perform better and run efficiently. And it is very important uh, with magnetic hard drives. So the hard drives with spinning disk. For solid state drives, Windows automatically trims the drives weekly. So especially with Windows 10 and Windows 11, uh, the Windows have make sure that the solid state drives have automatic trimming uh, enabled. Trimming uh, is basically um, what's happening there is an SSD is to erase a block on the drive that is filled with unused data. It is very similar to that of defragmenting, but it is not the same. That's why we have two different words, right? Otherwise we'll use the same term to describe uh, SSD trimming as SSD defragmenting. It is not the same as defragmenting a magnetic drive, but SSD trimming does a similar operation uh, like the 
defragmenting a magnetic drive and uh, windows 11 and windows 10 automatically have that trim enabled uh, weekly however if you are purchasing a high-end uh, solid state drive such as the drives from samsung i recommend that you install the samsung uh, solid state uh, drive uh, software and then uh, turn on the trimming there because that will uh, do it more efficiently according to manufacturer specification as opposed to going with the windows uh, automatic trimming so keep that in mind so most solid state hard drives such as samsung software especially high-end models does have software that you can install and i would recommend that you as an it technician you install those software on any time when you install a solid state drive so what trimming and defragmenting going to do is it's going to improve the hard drive performance that's everything for today if you have any questions or concerns don't hesitate to reach out to me until next time good luck with your exams and have a nice day